Om Sadashiva Samarambham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmaracharya Paryantham Vande Guru Paramparam Om. Good. Be seated, please. Om. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryan Karava Vahai Tejasvina Vadhita Mastuma Vidvisha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Om Very good Welcome back and welcome to all of our students attending these classes online. We continue our study of uh, Uddhava Gita. In the uh, previous class, we saw Uddhava's uh, question, twofold question. He asked uh, Sri Krishna, Sri Krishna had previously discussed the importance of satsanga. And satsanga includes what we're doing right now. Satsanga. And um, based on that, uh, Uddhava asked, well, Satsanga, association with Sat, Sadhu, good people, who are those with whom we should associate? If Satsanga is so important, Satsanga means association with whom? And in response to that, Sri Krishna began to describe 30 lakshanas, 30 qualities of the right kind of person to associate. I'm smiling because we all know the sad fact that there are many with whom we shouldn't associate. Some of them are at your workplace. Some of them, many of them, are in your government. <laughs> And, you know, a few of them might even be in your family. That's just the way life is. So, anyway, Sri Krishna is, is talking about those with whom you should associate. And then um, the second question, which we'll actually come to uh, in today's class, is what kind of bhakti should be practiced? And that'll be our next topic for today. Our next topic, because in our previous class we didn't quite finish those 30 lakshanas, we managed to finish exactly 28 of them. <laughs> we went through them fairly quickly, which means we have two remaining. So we will begin with that today. And this is with verse, yeah, verse 32. Good. Agnyaivam. Hmm? Agnyayayvam gunandoshan Agnyayayvam gunandoshan Maya dishtan api swakhan Maya dishtan api swakhan Dharman santhyajya yah sarvan Dharman santhyajya yah sarvan Mam bhajeta sa sattamaha Mam bhajeta sa sattamaha So in the first half we have the 29th of Sri Krishna's 30 qualities of a good person and a good person here is Agnyaya one who has understood evam thus one who has understood what thus Gunan and doshan. Guna here means good, good qualities, good actions, good deeds. Doshan here means the other kind, the harmful deeds. And this is our basic understanding of dharma. Anything 
which is harmful to yourself or others is a dharma. Anything that is helpful to yourself or others is dharma. Of course, life is complex, so it's not easy to discern. So we do our best to discern what is the path of least harm. This is a principle of dharma. Where did this principle of dharma come from? Well, of course, it's mentioned in many scriptures, and Sri Krishna himself teaches it in the Mahabharata. Uh, uh, he says, Ahimsa paramo dharmaha in Mahabharata. Ahimsa, non injury, is the parama dharma, is the ultimate principle of dharma. So it, it's taught in scripture. I'm pausing because the Hindu approach to ethics is so utterly unlike ethics and morality as found in other religious traditions. Pretty much every other religious tradition will have a, some kind of list of do's and don'ts, a list of commandments. Of course, there's no shortage of do's and don'ts in the Hindu tradition, but they aren't the foundation for ethics, for morality. So instead of these lists of commandments, as they're often taught, to, uh, called, instead we have a single principle, the principle of least injury, ahimsa paramo dharmaha. And this is, this principle, Sri Krishna says in the second line, it is maya dishtan. These are taught Adishtan, they're taught Maya by me. So Sri Krishna says, what I have taught about Dharma, about not harming others, about doing, doing good karmas, avoiding karmas, this is taught by me, Agnaya. So the, the good person is one who has fully understood. Maybe we should add something here. Sri Krishna says fully understood. Do you see the limitation there? Someone might understood, understand correctly, and then behave <laughs> contrary to what they understand based on everything that has come before the other 28 uh, virtues. So we know in that context that this means not just knowing, but acting upon that as well. And now we come to the last of the 30 characteristics of one with whom you should associate. And something about this might sound familiar to you. He says, Swakan dharman sarvan sarvan all dharman all dharmas swakan all of your own dharmas santyajya giving up. Now the familiar part in Bhagavad Gita, the culminating verse of Sri Krishna's teachings towards the end of the 18th chapter, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Maam Ekam Sharanam Vraja. This is perhaps one of the most important verses in the Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter. One of the few verses I remember the number, 66 because it's called Charama Shloka, the final verse of instruction. Not the end of the text, but the final verse of instruction, where Sri Krishna says, Sarva Dharman, when I hold off on a translation, all dharmas, paratyaja, completely giving up, mam ekam, I alone, Sharanam, I'm your refuge, Vraja. Seek refuge in me alone. Sri Krishna concludes there. And there's a lot of scope for <laughs> interpretation, and I'm laughing, interpretation and misinterpretation of this verse. Sarva dharman parat, give up dharma? What? <laughs> Obviously, it can't have that superficial meaning, but then you think about it further, sarva dharman, give up, 
you might imagine, give up all worldly activities and seek me alone. Sure sounds good. Give up all worldly activities, sarva dharman, give up all worldly activities and seek me alone, which suggests taking to a life of sannyasa, renouncing the world. But here we've got a huge problem because Sri Krishna is giving us instruction to whom? Arjuna, who is not eligible to become a sannyasi. He has responsibilities. He has, a, he has a family. He will have children. Finding the right, right time in history. And uh, he has children, actually, in the context of the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata. And um, he has other duties to perform, like fighting the war. So Sri Krishna certainly can't tell him, give up your responsibilities of family and fighting this war and seek me. It can't possibly mean that. So this verse is based on the Bhagavad Gita verse, so let's stay with that Bhagavad Gita verse for just a moment and understand how it is properly understood. It is widely misunderstood, how about give up all other religions? What other religions? <laughs> really speaking, in Sri Krishna's time in India, there was only one religion at that time. So, what do you mean, give up all other religions? And Anyway, some of you might have attended classes here when we studied that very important verse. And here, dharma. Dharma has so many meanings. Dharma can mean quality of something. The, quali the dharma of water is to be cold and wet. That's a common usage of the word dharma, especially in logic. So dharma has, if you look up in a dictionary, I'm sure there'll be at least 10 or 12 meanings in the Sanskrit dictionary. And it's pretty important to choose the right meaning. And here dharma is a reference to the purpose of life, the goal of life. So suppose we try to translate it along those lines. Give up all other goals of life. It starts to make more sense if we put it in the context of, of Vedanta. Give up all other goals of life. What, other, what kinds of goals are there? Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Remember these four goals called Purushartas? Kama, worldly enjoyment. Artha, wealth, security. Dharma, collecting religious merit so you can go to heaven in your next life. These are commonly sought goals of life. And chances are you have many goals as well, and those goals probably fall into one or all three of those categories, right? You want worldly pleasures, <coughs> you want wealth, security, who doesn't? And you want religious merit, whatever comes after this life, you don't want it to be any worse, this life is already tough, as, tough enough as it is. So therefore, religious merit becomes a legitimate goal of life. All three of these are legitimate goals of life, but not the only goals of life. Moksha, liberation, enlightenment, is held to be the parama purusharta, the ultimate goal of life. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> so when Sri Krishna here is saying sarva dharman pratyajya, giving up all other dharmas, giving up all other pursuits, giving up all other goals, giving up your narrow focus on kama, artha, and dharma. Mam ekam sharanam vraja, seek me alone, which we can paraphrase now, seek moksha 
alone seek enlightenment. Now, when he says paritya give up, um, even that word, ha not only does the word dharma have to be interpreted, but also paritya give up, that prefix pari has a sense of completeness. So get completely give up in all ways and manners, give up all other pursuits. Well, now we're back to that sannyasa meaning, which is not appropriate for Arjuna, and it's not appropriate for the vast majority of people. So, as I said, dharma, artha, and kama are legitimate goals of life. What Sri Krishna is saying here, in fact, it's kind of a modern topic. We talk about setting priorities in life. Many of these self-improvement seminars will have this as being a, a prominent topic. You should, you should set your priorities in life. <clears throat> Turn this up a little. We have many goals in life, many responsibilities, but in hmm, what is the priority of each? And this is really the topic here. And this is what we discussed long ago when we studied chapter 18. And that is, if kama, worldly pleasure, is a valid goal of life, but if it's your primary goal, if it's your highest prim priority, there's a word for you, a Greek word for you, called hedonist. <laughs> if worldly pleasure is your ultimate goal in life. Or if artha, wealth and, wealth and security, if that is your number one goal, there's a good English word for you, miser. <laughs> You're so focused on his money. And if um, dharma, collecting religious merit, is your primary goal in life, then you know people who are excessively pious, that kind of thing? That's also undesirable. So, a good way of, not a good way, a way of interpreting this verse that's in keeping with the vision of the entire Bhagavad Gita and teachings of Sri Krishna, the interpretation I would suggest is this. Make moksha, your first priority, and then everything else is also on the list. You have a to-do list. If you order your to-do list in the order of priority, if spiritual growth is number one on your list, that's what Sri Krishna is telling you to do. So that's a very simple way of understanding this, both in the Bhagavad Gita and here. And uh, very appropriately, it's the final spiritual teaching in the Bhagavad Gita. Here, it's the last of the 30 qualities, lakshanas, characteristics of that good person with whom you should associate. So that good person is one who has his or her priorities straight, as we say in American English. And to have your priorities straight according to Depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> but if you ask Sri Krishna, what does it mean to have your priorities straight? It means to have moksha, spiritual growth, as your number one priority. So, he says, sarvan, swakan, dharman, all of your own personal goals, we'll translate it, pursuits, Paritya giving up. Translated here, religious practices this is a common translation, but what I've just shared with you, I think, is much more helpful. <clears throat> so, with this, uh, we conclude our, our, the list of Sri Krishna's giving these 30 uh, characteristics. So, if you want to choose who to associate with, if they are lacking in these 30 qualities, I joked with you, somebody at work, somebody in government, etc. So it's pretty obvious whom you shouldn't associate with. Uh, before we move on, just 
to pick up one. We're talking, remember the overall context here is not who is a sadhu, who is a good person, but rather satsanga really is the topic here. And in a prior class, I said, and you've heard this before, the most important spiritual practice, without doubt, is satsanga. Of course, it's a very broad term. It includes what we're doing right now. It includes so much more. But literally, it means to choose carefully whom you associate with because we know all too well how we are affected by those we associate with. You know people whose lives have been destroyed because they associated with the wrong people. So, enough said. So, this verse now ends with the transition to the next topic. So, the next topic, remember, uh, Uddhava's second question was about bhakti, the practice of devotion. So, now we begin to transition to that topic, how to worship Ishvara, in general, how to worship Sri Krishna in particular. And so he says in the final line, Mam Bhajeta Saha, that Saha connects to Yaha, the one who has these 30 qualities, these 30, 30 signs of being a good person. Saha, in the last, per, in the last line, Saha, Mam Bhajeta, that person would definitely worship me. Why? That person is Satamaha. Sat as in satsang. Sat has so many meanings. Here we're taking sat in the sense of sadhu. Sat good, a good person. So a good person is sadhu, literally means a good person. So that's a sat, is good here. Satamaha. The most good, the best. We have we have sat tara, better, and sat tama, the best. That is the best person who has all 30 of these qualities and worships me, Sri Krishna. Now we turn to the uh, second of Uddhava's questions about devotion, about bhakti. Nyatva <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> 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 Te me bhakta tama mata, te me bhakta tama mata. <coughs> Excuse me. In the third line, bhajanti, one who worships, ananya bhavena. Beautiful expression. One who worships with a bhava, a feeling, which is ananya. And there are several ways of, of interpreting that word ananya. Not other is what it literally means. One common interpretation of that is constantly. So one who constantly worships me. Um, but a more literal meaning is, is much preferred. One who has no other. One who has no other goal, no greater goal, no higher goal. We're back to what we talked about in the prior verse. One who has spiritual growth as the number one priority. That is called here Ananya Bhakti. You've, many of you have heard that term before, Ananya Bhakti, <coughs> but you may have heard it expressed in terms of constant bhakti, constant devotion. 
When I say that word, constant devotion, I, I, I smile because I remember one of my guru's best jokes. And let me share that with you. Some of you have heard it before. So uh, he would describe different kinds of devotees, different kinds of worshipers, um, and his ex he would use it in the, in the context of explaining this ananya bhakta, one who has constant bhakti. He would contrast it with the person who comes into the temple, falls to on the floor in front of the altar, arms stretched out, this sashtanga namaskara, and tears flowing from the eyes and just praying loudly and just as overcome with devotion. And then the person stands up, walks out of the temple, gets in his car, and almost runs over several pedestrians on his, on his way home. <laughs> and my guru's sarcastic comment, he says, such a bhakta can be called a spasmodic devotee. <laughs> They go to the temple and they suffer a spasm of devotion, his exact words. And he observes that is the, the opposite of one meaning of ananya bhakti. So ananya bhakti is not to be that spasmodic devotee, but rather to have it as your life, a life of devotion, which we'll talk about in the coming verses. But as I said, the more profound interpretation of that ananya bhakti. It's used in many texts, you'll see that term. It really is a kind of bhakti that has no other devotion which is single-pointed. Some people, we just got done talking about, some people are devoted to money, some people are devoted to success, some people are devoted to power, etc., one who is devoted to Sri Krishna, one who is devoted to a life of spiritual growth alone, as we've discussed. And what does Sri Krishna say about such people? In the last line, te, they, me, mata, are considered by me, they are considered by me to be bhakta tamaha. They are, and there's a tama again. In English, we have er and est. So in Sanskrit, we have tara and tama. Tara, er, and tama, est. So, bhakta tama, the best of devotees. They are bhakta tama, the best of devotees. Now, in the first half of the verse, which we saved for the end, Sri Krishna makes a very interesting observation about who is the best devotee. And you'll see something very surprising in his description. He says, Jnatva agnatva ata ye imam. Ye, those who, Jnatva maam, those who know me, agnata ata maam. And, those who don't know me. Those who don't know me how, in the second line, yavan, how great I am, yahacha, my true nature, those who don't know yadrashaha, what, what kind, uh, uh, what, what is my, yeah, yadrashaha, better, what, what is my nature, yahacha, one who, does, one who knows me as I am. So there are some who know, and some who don't know, among these bhaktas, Sri Krishna says, there are some who know me and some who don't know me. By the way, in Sri Krishna's language here, to know Sri Krishna as he truly is means to be enlightened. That's his idea. That's what he's teaching us here. Which means, what is Sri Krishna saying here? Among the best devotees, there are some who are enlightened and some who are not. That's exactly what he says. Just to make a distinction, 
between bhakti and enlightenment. There are some who are filled with bhakti, not, not our spasmodic devotee, but others who are so devoted to living a pious, prayerful life, they may or may not be enlightened. Enlightenment is a further step. Of course, the term ananya bhakti, actually it comes in Narada Bhakti Sutra, and if I remember right, in that context, it means to know Sri Krishna as being non-separate from you. That's yet another interpretation of that word, ananya bhakti. To recognize your non-separation from the God of the cosmos. Another interpretation of ananya bhakti. And that person is definitely enlightened. That's our definition. One definition of enlightenment is to know that the individual is not separate from the whole. You, your true nature is divine. The truth of who you are is Satchirananda Atma, which is identical to the God of the, of the cosmos. This is enlightenment. Sri Krishna says that you can be a, the best of bhaktas, but not be enlightened. So what is the message here? You can have bhakti without enlightenment, but can you have enlightenment without bhakti? If you, this is a little tricky, but if you followed the discussion here, if enlightenment means knowing your true divine nature, knowing that you are non-separate from Krishna, God of the cosmos, it's impossible to have enlightenment without bhakti. Now, not bhakti necessarily like our spasmodic devotee. It doesn't mean everyone who is enlightened will have tears running down their eyes whenever they stand in front of a temple. That's silly. That's not what it means. But every enlightened person will feel, and I'm using that word intentionally, will feel a continual sense of connection non-separateness to Ishwara, in this case to Sri Krishna. The enlightened person never feels separate, never feels alone, never feels bereft in, in any sense. So very interesting observation. A devotee may or may not be enlightened, but anyone who is light, enlightened definitely is a is a devotee is knows knows Sri Krishna as he truly is now that having been said now we go on Sri Krishna goes on to describe a variety of devotional practices previously we had a list of 30 qualities of the uh, good person that you should associate he's going to give us a list of of devotional practices, I didn't bother counting. There are more than 30. <laughs> I'm sure there's more than 30. So, um, why so many different devotional practices? We already discussed Nava Vidha Bhakti, that ninefold bhakti, and now we're going to see a whole series of devotional practices. Why so many? Let's take up that question at the very end of the class. Let's see some of the practices first, and we probably won't finish the whole list. We'll go through them, some of them anyway. And then after that, then let's discuss why so many. And please notice that in... Actually, we'll, we'll come to all of that. So let, let's just uh, proceed. So he begins this description, goes on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven verses. He's going to discuss different, uh, different devotional practices. He begins, Malinga mad bhakta jana, Malinga mad bhakta jana, darshana sparshan archanam, 
darshanasparshanarchanam paricharya stuti prahva paricharya stuti prahva guna karmanu kirtanam guna karmanu kirtanam so he begins malinga mat linga my not his physical form linga by the way in a dictionary linga especially in shivaratri we all you're all thinking about the kind of linga that's on the altar look it up in a dictionary that's not the first definition in fact it's not even the second or third <laughs> definition so linga means a sign an indicator so a sign or indicator, Sri Krishna says, Matlinga, a sign or indicator of me, well, who is it standing in the middle of our altar, is Matlinga. It is a sign, it is a, we call it Murti, a sacred form, so that sacred form of Lord Shiva. So Matlinga, sacred forms of Lord of Lord uh, Krishna. And what about those sacred forms? The practice is in the second line, darshana, when you stand before an altar and see. By the way, you all, ha most of you know this word darshana. You go for, say, Bhagavan's darshana. What? Bhagavan ki darshan, I think you'd say. Um, there's two sides to that. Not only are you seeing the deity, but aren't you being seen? <laughs> we forget that, that part of it. Of, of course, that kind of darshana goes on 24-7. You are always in Ishvara's view, metaphorically. You are never out of his view. But when you stand in front of an altar, then it becomes very obvious. You are not only seeing, you are being seen. And that being seen is where that sense of blessings come from. To have darshana is to be blessed. And the blessing comes not because you see, but the blessing comes because you are seen. So this is the second meaning of darshana. So darshana, not only darshana, sparshana, touching. Some of you are thinking, wait a minute. In South India, that priest will chase us out. And don't come near these deities. You will make these deities impure. You can be chased, chased out of the temple. I know that's a South Indian tradition. Fortun it's not a North Indian tradition very often you are invited to come and touch the deity. And here we see more of a North Indian tradition being described. So darshana, sparshana, touching, and, ar and archana, worshipping. So, makes sense. Darshana, uh, sparshana, and archana, uh, worshipping of what? That mudlinga, my form, that, that deity on the altar, that murti. The surprising part here is not only Sri Krishna in the temple, who is present? It's just a little bit like this darshana thing. Um, who is present in the temple? Well, obviously, Ishvara, some form of God, is present in the temple. Who else? All the worshipers, right? So there's a deity and collectively all of the worshippers that Sri Krishna also talks about. He says, Mat Bhakta Jana, those who are devoted to me, who are present in the temple, who are worshipping the deity on the altar. And what does Sri Krishna say about them? That you are blessed through darshana, not just of the form on the altar, you are blessed by darshana of the other worshippers. You're blessed by sparshana. In crowded temples, you can't, av <laughs> you can't avoid <laughs> rubbing shoulders, as it were, with all the other uh, worshippers. And even archana. 
literally worship. I mean, what do you mean, worshiping those who come to the temple? Every, every, you already know, every person is an, an embodiment of that divine. So in, and it's generally true, in a temple, generally people are treated with so much respect. Outside anything goes. <laughs> but inside the temple, people receive that respect because in that environment, perhaps you are led to reflect on all these people gathered together here to worship. They are all embodiments of the divine. Now, we're just getting started here. Other forms of worship include paricharya, different forms of service. In a, in a temple, it could mean changing the clothes of the deity, making malas, uh, keeping the temple clean. We'll come to a lot of that later. Stutihi, praise. Um, there are so many prayers. And stotras in Sanskrit, Hindi, other languages, prayers of praise. Is a, these are another form of worship. Also, prahva, guna, karma, Anukirtanam. Guna and karma, guna, the qualities, and karma, deeds. Whose qualities and deeds? Well, grammar allows you to connect it to that first line. So the, the guna and karma, the qualities and deeds of Sri Krishna, in this case, and the qualities and deeds of all the gathered worshippers, devotees, to anukirtanam, to sing the glories of both God and devotees, and to sing them prahwa, humbly, modestly. Um, in many devotional traditions, a lot of emphasis on humility, because the greater, <laughs> is an interesting observation, the greater you are, the lesser <laughs> Bhagavan is. And the greater Bhagavan is in your estimation, in your view, the lesser you are. So it's the basis for um, humility. Let's see a few more of these many devotional practices. He continues. Matkata Shravane Shraddha, Matkata Shravane Shraddha, Madanudhyana Muddhava, Madanudhyana Muddhava, Sarvala Bhopaharanam, Sarvala Bhopaharanam, Dasye Natmani Vedanam, Dasye Natmani Vedanam. Something interesting in that first line. Mat kata shravane shraddha. Shraddha. We'll tentatively translate as faith. Faith in what? Shravane, in listening to the kata stories about mat, the pronoun for Sri Krishna. So listening to stories about Sri Krishna, shraddha, with Shraddha leads to a very interesting topic. Many people have heard all these amazing stories of Sri Krishna chasing gopis around, playing in the bushes, <laughs> and all of the, And then people will ask, "Are these real? Are these stories real?" So, by the way, those stories are mostly found in secondary literature. The, they have their roots, of course, in the Bhagavata Purana. What are we studying? Bhagavata Purana. Remember, the small part of Bhagavata Purana. So these stories have their roots, but you won't find these detailed stories in the Bhagavata Purana of Sri Krishna and the gopis. So then where does all, all these stories come from? secondary literature, great pious saints and scholars who wrote so many wonderful scriptures to inspire all the devotees, leading then to this crucial question. Sri Krishna says to have shraddha, faith, in listening to all of these stories, 
including, well, actually, I think a story that is, I believe, in the Bhagavata Purana, is when um, um, Yashodha opened Sri Krishna's mouth. I told this story before, or referred to the story before. Sri Krishna is still a, an infant, and he eats some dirt. Yashodha is taking care of him, opens his mouth to get the dirt out, and sees inside his mouth the entire universe. Now, Stories like that, and I believe that story is actually told in the Bhagavata Purana, not in the secondary literature. So, is that story to be taken as a literal fact? Is the Bhagavata Purana like a history book that records actual events as factually as possible? We've had this discussion in other contexts. And many of you, you may not agree, some people don't like to hear this, but I think it's obvious that the Bhagavata Purana is not a history book. It's not a history book. <laughs> the same Bhagavata Purana tells about stories of Narada floating around in the air and meeting Lord Vishnu and all of this stuff. Really? <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of playing with this because there are some pretty far-fetched stories in this Purana and all the others. Amazing stories that th the word incredible means not credible. <laughs> How do we deal with these stories? These incredible, not credible stories. Again, the Bhagavata Purana and all the Puranas are not history books. These are not records of events exactly as they took place. So, therefore, and the part that people don't like to hear is what I'm sharing right now, they're not history. So many people, not maybe not you, but many people um, feel that these stories took place exactly as described in the scriptures. And if they feel that way, blessings to them, wonderful. They have the faith of a child, which is something very pure and very simple and very powerful. Suppose you don't have that faith, childlike faith, not childish, childlike faith, that simplicity, that purity. I don't have that. There's too much thinking going on up here, which gets into conflict with all of that. What to do? Well, the solution to this problem is to really understand what Sri Krishna is saying here. This is an important point, so I'm taking, taking time. And maybe we'll finish the class with this point and then come back to this verse next week. This is an extremely important point. What is the purpose of those stories? So the story of Yashodha Ma seeing the entire universe in Sri Krishna's mouth, the stories of Sri Krishna chasing gopis around in the, in the forest, the stories of Narada Muni floating around in the sky and meeting, going to heaven and meeting with uh, Lord Vishnu and the other deities. What is the purpose of those stories? Is the purpose to give us historical information? Or is the purpose to instill devotion? Right? The purpose is not to give us historical information, not a history book. The purpose is to instill devotion, leading to something, an observation that I think you might find very helpful. The observation is this. If you take all of these stories as being historically true, and you don't feel a sense of devotion, 
that makes you a historian, right? <laughs> if you read all these stories and accept them as true, but without feeling that bhakti bhava, that feeling of devotion in your heart, that doesn't make you a devotee. That makes you a historian. <laughs> Correct? But suppose you reject the historicity of those stories. I do. I get that. Suppose you reject the historicity of those, of those stories, but those stories inspire you with devotion. It means you're not a historian, and that's a good thing. <laughs> it means you really are a devotee. You are a bhakta. You are one full of devotion. So let us not lose sight of the purpose of, of, those, uh, of those stories. Back to this word shraddha. Um, shraddha like any word, has so many meanings. To take shraddha in the sense of andha-vishwasa, blind faith, in my mind, that's terrible to take shraddha in that sense. And that's, not only is it terrible just in a linguistic way, it is so contrary to the whole Hindu tradition and to the teachings of Advaita Vedanta in particular, a tradition that is not based on blind faith. A tradition that again and again invites you to ask questions, engage your intellect. By the, something many of you born in India, you take it for granted that it's okay to ask questions, even though some of you as children, you ask questions, your children, your parents may have said, don't ask questions. Did that happen to you? You ask questions, your parents says, don't ask. Why? The reason is not because you're not supposed to ask, you're supposed to ask, honestly. Commentaries are full of questions. <laughs> That's a whole commentarial tradition in that, especially in Advaita Vedanta, is asking challenging questions. It's always been part of the tradition, a tradition not based just on blind faith, a question that invites, I'm sorry, a tradition that invites you to use your intellect. Then why did your parents say, don't ask? You know the answer. They said, don't ask, because they didn't know the answer to your question. That's all it is. <laughs> If they knew the answer to your question, they would have told you. They didn't know. And you can't blame them. That's the culture and time in which they were raised. Anyway, my point here is to think about Shraddha in terms of blind faith is absolutely contrary to the spirit of Hinduism, to the spirit of the ancient rishis. So, Shraddha does not mean blind faith. Faith. So when Sri Krishna says having shraddha in my stories, it doesn't mean accepting those stories as historically true. But it does mean shraddha does refer to your, your, your heart in a manner of speaking. So here shraddha does mean having, almost defies uh, translation in English. I don't think there's any word in English as rich in meaning as this word shraddha, but based on what we just, just said, to listen to those stories and be filled with devotion as a result of hearing those stories. To have the stories invoke bhakti bhava, the feeling of devotion. That's what Sri Krishna means here by Shraddha. So not, not blind faith in the historicity of all these stories, but rather allowing those stories to generate in your mind and heart a feeling of closeness, connectedness, devotion to, Shri, in this case, to Sri Krishna. Okay, this is a good place to stop. This is a very important uh, word and concept. Um, 
we'll finish the verse in our next class. Oh, no, I didn't even. Huh. I said we would discuss at the end of the class um, why so many forms of devotion. Again, that, that too, we'll wait to the next class and, and discuss why so many devotional practices. Next week. Um, uh, quick announcements. Tomorrow, Sunday, uh, we have our uh, Vedanta class, Shankara's Brilliant Text at 10 o'clock, followed by Satsanga at 11. Come with your questions. Also, just to remind you, Daylight Savings Time come, starts tomorrow, so make sure that you come for class at the right time. We'll conclude with our prayers at the altar. <clears throat> Om Ganana Hantwa Ganapati Gamavamahe Kavinga Vina Upama Shravastamam Jeshtarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Patahana Shrenvan Utubisida Sadanam O Mahaganapataye Namaha Ishwaro Guru Hatmeti Murti Beda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murta Ye Namaha Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kam Sachanuramardanam Devaki Paramhanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kascha Dukha Bhagavad Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Mahamratangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat <laughs>